Ladies and gentlemen, you're all very welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for what I know is going to be a really interesting and engaging um, session with a, a really excellent, experienced, <coughs> insightful speaker. Um, but before we get going, um, just a couple of quick things. I can find the usual announcements about mobile phones. Um, although that particular announcement has sort of very little over the years. You used to be told to switch them off. But more recently, you're invited to keep your phone on, but on silent, so that you can tweet if that's your uh, intonation. Um, but the main thing is, if they could, uh, could please keep them on silent. And if you are motivated to tweet, the handle is at IIEA. Um, so just as you'll appreciate the initial address, which we'll have in a few moments, and I have a distinguished guest to introduce our speaker. But the initial address is on the record, as is the practice here. But the Q&A session that we have afterwards, we usually apply and do apply Chatham House rules in the sense that there's a, a, a measure of protection for what people would like to say um, in, in, in this environment. Uh, and they can very often afford um, um, a more, um, an, easy, an easier, um, at times more insightful uh, exchange if people uh, are confident that they're not going to be quoted afterwards. Um, so when we do come to the q and I'll ask you to indicate and to say who you are, uh, just to identify yourself. But anyway, before uh, all of that, I'm delighted to invite uh, to the rostrum to introduce our guest speaker, Tracy Kajumba of Irish Aid. Tracy, will you come forward? Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tracy Kajumba. I work with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as a regional climate change and development advisor for Sub-Saharan Africa, where we have what we call key partner countries, about nine of them. But then we cross over to Southeast Asia and work in Vietnam. That also takes care of Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar in the development program. So it gives me great pleasure this afternoon to warmly welcome you and introduce Ms. Rachel Kite the Chief Executive Office of Sustainable Energy for All, Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All, and Co-Chair of the UN Energy. I would also like to express my sincere thanks to the IIEA for the invitation to make an introduction this afternoon. We thank you. As a long-standing advocate for access to energy, reliable, modern energy services, Ms. Kate work, Ms. Kate's work has effectively connected the dots between access to energy and our broad objective to make sustainable development a reality for all and leaving no one behind. And our previous policy was very strong on energy. And our current policy is strong on climate and still energy is one of the areas that we really want to focus on. She has long championed climate action, sustainable development, and tackling the root causes of poverty and inequality. This is clearly illustrated in the various roles that Ms. Kate has undertaken over the last few years. Uh, from the statistics, one billion people around the world still live without electricity, and mostly in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia as well. And the financing needed to help close the access gap is in billions, if not trillions. There's still a lot to be done. But without being overwhelmed by the challenge and scary numbers, Rachel has led the charge and changed the way we understand energy and how it relates to the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. She has covered the topic from all angles, from strengthening engagement of financial institutions and investors to the promotion of non-traditional and more localized energy sources and championing energy efficiency as an essential solution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also creating employment for the unskilled forces. In her capacity as World Bank Group Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change, Rachel was instrument, instrumental in steering the World Bank ship towards much stronger integration of climate action across its operations. It's not easy to do. My role is cross-cutting, and I know how tough it is to really achieve that. So doing so, I help the bank play an essential role in global climate ambition ahead of the COP21 in 2015 and in the years after the Paris Agreement was adopted. So it comes as no surprise that Ms. Kate holds numerous titles related to the global energy transition, 
in addition to her position as CEO for Sustainable Energy for All. In her role as special representative, she's the UN focal point person for the global goal on sustainable energy, spearheading SDG 7 on sustainable energy. Uh, in terms of Ireland's approach to climate change and energy, um, Ireland's international climate and sustainable development efforts have and will continue championing the voices of the poor and vulnerable to climate impacts. <coughs> Ireland plays a leading role within the EU in relation to cooperation with least developed countries and small and developing island states, many of which continue to lack access to modern, reliable and clean energy sources. Through our bilateral programs and as part of the EU, we have supported pro poor energy in Malawi. We're having a chat about that and trying to link energy to other sectors like social protection and health, uh, and both not only just for access and, uh, and sustainability, but also having groups produce and earn income out of it. So looking at the livelihood part as well. And in Vietnam, uh, we have focus on reducing deforestation, providing clean energy for women and girls, and providing income to user groups as well, most of which are women. Solar energy has also been provided in health facilities in hard to reach areas to improve maternal health and services for women and children. We're in the scoping stage for partnerships that stimulate innovative climate solutions through small, medium-sized enterprises and entrepreneurs in our partner countries. A key feature of potential projects and initiatives is likely to be small scale and local sustainable energy solutions, given the countries that we are working in. We're also looking into supporting initiatives that fund investments in areas such as clean cooking facilities, community adaptation and solar lighting for communities and households in African countries, such as Ethiopia and Eritrea. That is work in progress. And while these ideas and opportunities may be small in comparison to the large scale energy projects that are happening all over the world, they demonstrate that sustainable energy access can and must be realized at all levels by different actors. Our newly launched policy on international development, A Better World, firmly places climate action as a key priority for Ireland's international development cooperation efforts. It demonstrates Ireland's political and substantive commitment to strengthen our climate efforts on resilience, including community-led solutions to adaptation and mitigation. Our new policy also reflects the interrelated nature of climate change and access to clean, reliable, and affordable energy services. Through our international development cooperation, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade will collaborate more closely with Irish businesses, NGOs, to maximize knowledge, technology transfer, and innovation for climate solutions. And this is uh, through the trade arm with the embassies in the different countries where we are working. However, we all know that making Agenda 2030 and especially SDG 7 a reality for all, we need inclusive approaches that will ensure that governments, local authorities, businesses, and citizens are all involved in addressing the energy challenge. With this in mind, I look forward to hearing from Rachel and listening to her perspective on how we can all contribute to achieving sustainable energy for all. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much to everybody at IIEA for the invitation to be here. It's, um, it's always a pleasure to be in this wonderful city. Um, my, I have a personal plea before we get into the substance, which is if I can arrange for the Millennium Stadium roof to stay open tomorrow, <laughs> would, would you give me a passport? No, no, no. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, um, coming from just across the water it's, it's, um, to, the, uh, to the east, it's, it's very nice to be here. Um, I, on my way here, I walked, and uh, I was... Um, I was walking against the tide of uh, school children um, in small groups with there is no planet B signs and pictures of the earth, um, kids with their parents, young kids with their parents, teenagers in school uniform. 
Um, and uh, it moved me um, because we are at a moment where, and we were discussing at lunch, well, I feel that we're moving from sort of a, 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 a need to, to have more urgency in, in our work around um, the Sustainable Development Goals and a, and a, and a series of um, actions which would build a more inclusive society, a more sustainable society, and our need for climate action. We're moving from sort of a, a framing of this as, as needing more urgency to what I think young people are asking of us, which is, well, could we put ourselves on an emergency footing? So from urgency to emergency, and it sounds like that's just, you know, some kind of construct. But when you think about it, it's actually a, an opportunity um, to reset uh, with everybody sort of realising that we're in this boat together, right? There's no scenario where one end of the boat goes up and they're OK and the people at the other end of the boat aren't. And we have to find a way to get government, business and society uh, aligned um, a little more powerfully than it is today. The Secretary General, the Secretary General um, sort of wrings his hands a little at the moment because he believes that since 2015, when we signed the Sustainable Development Goals, when we signed the Paris Agreement, that the business leadership, as it actually has in large part, started to really ratchet down and think through what this really means. And you've seen leading companies in all sectors of the economy embracing a sort of <coughs> science-based targets approach, right, that the science needs to drive the direction of their business. You've seen, I think, the um, leadership within part of the financial sector now beginning to reach truly material levels. So when Mark Carney, uh, chairman of the Bank of England and co-chair of the FSB, will tell you that $106 trillion worth of um, um, assets within the economy are now voluntarily going to report under the TCFD, which is the Transparency Climate um, Disclosure that companies uh, are being asked to follow. And he will tell you that he expects in the next two to three years that that starts to become mandatory, not just in France and a few other countries, but across the world. You start, you're starting to see that that business leadership has gone from the sort of rah rah, we can, you know, we can take our corporate social responsibility and make it material to something truly profound. Not there yet, but he sees green shoots. He sees the kids on the streets. He's seen the school strikes over the last two to three months really take hold globally. Um, he wrings his hands because he's asking, where is, where's the political leadership? It seems rather insipid, to use his phrase at the moment. And I think what the kids are asking for is, um, we're all on the same side, right? <laughs> uh, we have to figure this out together, and can we do it together? Because we want, um, we, we believe this is an emergency. We want emergency scale response. So just walking here, that contextualizes what I want to say to you today. Uh, it's important to talk about the Sustainable Development Goals. It is important to talk about the challenge within getting everybody access to reliable, affordable, clean power um, in, a, in a place like this, because Ireland has traditionally hit above its weight in its interactions globally. I'm glad that there are uh, colleagues from Irish Aid here, but this is a, this is a country who's in premature within the international community has, uh, is, a, is a focus on those that we must not leave behind, has been a focus on, um, on the most vulnerable within society, whether it's been uh, refugees, whether it's been through food security, whether it's been the sort of authenticity that Irish aid has brought and Irish foreign policy has brought to these issues because of Ireland's own history and the way in which Irish people <coughs> understand that history. But so this is, this, is, this is a country that can understand that if we can build structures, policies, financial uh, ingenuity that can reach those who are traditionally left out, the last mile first in energy terms, then we can actually take care of everybody else as well. And that's the challenge of an inclusive and clean e economy together. So I'm glad to be here. And my inspiration perhaps for part of my comments is a trip that I made in July last year with the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations with the Africa Union um, uh, Commissioner for Women, Peace and Security and the then Chair of the uh, Security Council. At that point, it was Sweden. So this was an all-women delegation. 
something that the elders of Niger hadn't seen uh, many times before. Um, um, they, were, they were on a swing along the 50th parallel, right? They were on a swing from South Sudan through Chad, uh, through the Sahel, uh, looking at the issues of gender, peace and security, development, climate change. I joined them for part of that trip, um, and I was struck by how the poorest of the poor, the most vulnerable in our society today, uh, people living in extremely marginal conditions um, in the Sahel, uh, women-headed households in, in far-flung rural villages, are, are the testament to what climate change is doing to the development challenge, what climate change is doing to the security challenge, and that none of the answers will be found if we don't actually take care of women first uh, and children first. And so... These are villages where the f drought cycle was when I was last working in that part of the world for IUCN about 20 years ago. The drought cycle was every 10 years. The drought cycle then went down to about five years and then to about two years when I helped put out the turn down the heat reports in the, from the World Bank in, in 2013. And now in 2018, the drought cycle is basically permanent. So these are extremely marginal uh, livelihoods at the best of times, now in almost a permanent drought situation. Uh, there is no health care. There is uh, mar some education provision, but very little. Um, there is uh, very little technical assistance for farming and for crop development. There is an omnipresent and multiple presence of extreme vi uh, violence. Uh, trying to um, <coughs> offer a different alternative for these people. There is child marriage. There is great inequity between the status of women and men. And it sounds like, okay, well, this is just very bleak. And I think it was shocking because climate change is just undermining every attempt that these people have to stand up on their own and to move forward. And every attempt that we as the international community are bringing to bear to help. And now our attempts to help are going to be coming from defence spending and from security spending because we don't want these people to come north. And so this becomes a multiple challenge. But when one thinks about what could happen if elders accepted that child marriage was not the best thing for their communities, if we could get solar drip for, drop for crop irrigation in and allow them to be able, using the technology which is freely available elsewhere in the world, to be able to um, increase their incomes at the village level, at the community level, if we can bring solar into the health clinic and run a health clinic at least for some hours of the day with some decent provision, if we can get off-grid cooling available so that those crops can actually be kept and then sent to market and the income increased again. If we can use that sustainable cooling option now, which is available, and put, use that to make sure that the vaccines and medicines are kept at between two to eight degrees, and that therefore um, the uh, possibility that their children will live better for longer is realized, you can see that we can take a truly marginal and critical situation and make it better. The good news is that we have all of that technology. We have all of that technology. The good news is it's not very expensive. The bad news is that we have not yet really grasped that climate change is pulling the rug out from under people and that as it pulls the rug out from the people who are the most vulnerable, that we are very, clo we are very close behind and it will pull the rug out from us as well. So with a new lens, I think that there is something to be done. And if we have to just talk about it in broad economic terms, then the amounts of money that are being discussed in European capitals today for security assistance and humanitarian assistance into this part of the world relative to the much lower numbers that would be used for sustainable development speak for themselves. Now, of course, these countries have a responsibility to manage their budgets better. They have a responsibility to stop the $50 billion <coughs> worth of money that leaves Africa every year into bank accounts elsewhere in the world illicitly. And just if 10% of that was invested into off-grid energy, we would be 
doing much better than we are today. So this is not just a challenge of the international community. It's not just a challenge of the Western notion of assistance, but it is something that is within our grasp. And so when I walk past those schoolgirls on the way here today and they say, this is an emergency, <coughs> I agree with them, and I believe that we have many of the tools available to us. So I just told you about today, but if you close your eyes and think about tomorrow, I can think about a secondary city in Niger by 2030 or 40, you know, being a vibrant commercial centre with a clinic on the corner of the town square working day and night with Nigerian nurses and doctors working there because they now have somewhere to work and to do good work. I can see um, uh, shops and uh, small businesses running into the evening because there is a mini grid working perfectly well, providing, with, providing all of the energy necessary. It's coming with storage and it's coming with the extraordinary solar resource that the Sahel has. There is a cooling facility available for all farmers to place their yields. That cooling facility has an outer core, which is where medicines are kept. It is community run and community owned. People have jobs, the kids are in school, they're doing better, they're eating better, and they have hope. All of this is possible by embracing what we already begin to see now, which is new energy technologies, new business models around those technologies, and an embrace of off-grid and grid. Why? Because it's going to be too expensive and it's going to take too long to extend the power lines to everybody who doesn't get to benefit from them today. And so if we can think about integrated energy systems where we improve the grid and where we allow um, people and businesses to access off-grid resources as well, and merge the two together, not being frightened that one will go out of business when the other arrives, but actually laying the policy table so that both can coexist, you can build resilience into your energy system and you can serve more people more quickly, uh, more cheaply. And this isn't just for Niger or for Burkina Faso or for Mali. This is for Ireland, this is for New Jersey, this is for the United Kingdom, this is for Germany. We know that post-extreme uh, uh, weather events, it's much quicker to get people back into having some kind of energy services by allowing off-grid to grow and what we've learned from Superstorm Sandy and elsewhere is that those stay once the grid comes back as well. And that flexibility and that resilience becomes very important. And in a world where extreme weather events are expected to just multiply in their ferocity and in their uh, frequency, it seems to me that these are lessons that can be, can be learned globally. So in 2015 we said everybody needs to get access to energy. It should be universal. It needs to be much more efficient than it is today, and renewables will have to be a very big part of that story. Basically, what we did is we made a political deal, is that we will have to decarbonise our energy systems, that's the Paris Climate Agreement, and we have to leave no one behind. Africa would not have come to the table in Paris and agreed the ambition of the Paris Climate Agreement unless they believed there was something in it for them, and what was in it for them was going to be the financing coming through the Green Climate Fund and elsewhere, but was the concept that we would not leave them behind. That we wouldn't decarbonise the economy for the 1%, we would decarbonise it for everybody. What's extraordinary about the energy transitions piece of this story is that we have two great things that we can latch onto. One is digitalisation and the opportunities that that offers us for huge energy efficiency and decentralisation, what I've already started to talk about, that you can imagine not one energy system, but multiple energy systems, highly decentralised, using digital technology to be much more efficient and to allow you to really uh, understand what the energy demand is. And if you do both of those things, you can speed up the rate at which you decarbonise. Once you've done all three, You've decarbonised, you've digitalised, you've decentralised your energy systems or you're on the pathway to that. You have effectively democratised them. So for our children and for some of us, you know, our, our, our house is going to give us a big part of our energy. Our car will give us part, part of our energy. 
where we work, our office building or whatever, is going to be giving us part of our energy. Gone is the traditional relationship of a business or a household to some central utility somewhere. Now, that is a truly transformative shift within the economy, but one which, if realised well, is going to be freeing for, for a lot of productivity, uh, freeing for a lot of people who today are ill-served by the energy systems that we've built up to now. So we have energy systems that mean that one in seven people don't have any access to electricity, where one in, uh, one in four people don't have access to clean fuels for cooking. So we failed so far to meet their needs. We have an energy system which is highly, highly inefficient, despite extraordinary amounts of uh, money and time put into trying to improve efficiencies in transmission and distribution and in generation. And we have uh, an energy system which is killing us. And I use the word advisedly, but the work that's come, up, come out of the WHO and Lancet in the last uh, two years around health quality, and there will be at least two to three more uh, peer-reviewed uh, reports coming out this year and early next year, which show us that teenagers today are made more stupid by the air that they breathe, that uh, children's life expectancy is severely impacted by the air that they breathe, and not in Delhi, and not in Shanghai, but in London, and in Manchester and Southampton, and I don't know the data for Dublin, but I would imagine here too. And so we have an energy system which is, is taking away the uh, intelligence that we need to get us through this transition in the future. So something has to change for, for many, many, many reasons. Now, why am I optimistic that we can do this? Because I think there is a critical path to where we need to be by 2050. So by 2050, we basically need to be living in decarbonised economy. The energy transition will have had to drive the, map, the most <coughs> of that. If we are using carbon in our energy system by 2050, we will have to be capturing it and using it. So a way to think about this is, and you've seen just in the last few days, big announcements from Shell about uh, how they see themselves as an energy, uh, energy services company, not as an oil and gas company. You've seen great embarrassment for BP because they've been caught lobbying on the wrong side. They're not the only one, they're just the one that got caught. Um, you can see that some of the big traditional companies are thinking their, their way through this uh, transition. The way that I think about it, and this is taking away from uh, Professor Sokolov at uh, Princeton, is that if you are in the business of getting carbon out of the earth in any way at all, then you are basically a carbon molecule management company. So you can dig it up, but you can't let it escape into the atmosphere. So you can use it again and again and again. You can capture it. You can plough it back into something else. You can make concrete out of it. You can grow algae with it. I don't care what you do. It just can't go into the atmosphere. And that has to be the formulation then for regulation going forward. And that will happen because the financial sector will begin to penalise. Investors will seek returns from a cleaner energy system. And I think the public mood will begin to shift. So... I believe that it is technically possible to do what we're asking ourselves to do. We then have to put energy efficiency first. 40% of the emissions reductions we need come from, uh, could, could be achieved through energy efficiency. It is the human condition that we would not do what is so obvious. It is the human condition that we walk straight past this cheap and easy solution and start worrying about who's going to govern and pay for geoengineering. Um, some would say it's a male condition. I'm not going to go there, but maybe in the questions and answers we can look at that. But what's really <laughs> exciting about energy efficiency is if we embrace it, and I see huge demand for this now from the countries uh, that Irish Aid is working in, is that if you can actually now, for 40 watts, provide people with all of their basic needs, uh, which you know 10 years ago was going to take you 250 or 300 watts, then we can really do something extraordinary. We're involved in something called the Global Cooling Prize, and basically what it is, and with, I think, almost 3,000 teams now competing from around the world, is who can, do, who can build the household unit air conditioner that can operate at five times the efficiency of anything on the market today, 
that can operate without super pollutants, so no HFCs, and which can be retailed in the Indian market at a price point where the lower middle class that are emerging into high rises and who want to have cooling and are not going to accept that they may not have cooling, that they can afford. Right? So these are the things that we are able to <coughs> imagine and do. So energy efficiency first, especially on the demand side for those who are living without energy to today. Secondly, then we have to close the access gap. Why? Well, because it's not fair. Secondly, you can't get economic productivity without it. If the countries that don't have access don't have economic productivity, they're going to cause other problems if you want to look at it that way. But the one billion people who don't have access today, 80% uh, of them are living in just 20 countries. So this is something where the international community can come in behind a known set of, of countries and really uh, finds ways, find ways to solve the problem. And because we have access to off-grid renewable energy solutions as well as improvement in grid, so by densifying the grid in the fast-growing cities of Africa and Asia and by building off-grid energy, we can actually close that energy access gap. Now, we have growing energy poverty for people living under austerity in the developed world as well. And some of the solutions that you can find in Nairobi um, or in Dhaka, Bangladesh, are just as applicable in a high-rise in Newham in the east of London as well. Because the woman who is working out how long she can run her oven after she's put 50p in the meter and whether or not she can cook chicken and two vegetables for her kids on a Sunday lunchtime... The sophistication of her financial management skills is exactly the same as the sophistication of the woman-headed household in an in informal settlement on the edge of Nairobi who is trying to work out how much of her income she can afford to use for fuel for the stove or how much she can run her solar mm -hmm. home system for and how many minutes for that solar home system she can pay for through the phone. So we basically have, when you get to the bottom of the pyramid... The same, the same kind of financial sophistication that needs to be served by, by the businesses of the future. The good news is that both access and efficiency can be achieved by pursuing renewables even more aggressively than we already see today. And this is just the energy system. Of course, renewables will revolutionise uh, transport and will begin to revolutionise even the hard-to-abate sectors. Short-haul flights in Europe are going to be electric within 20 years. Short-haul boats in, uh, and in, inland shipping are going to be electric within 20 years. You already, see the, you already see this happening in the Netherlands, but also in China on the Yangtze. You see the, the, the uh, speed of which where, where the R&D is going, and you, you start to be able to see how quickly these hockey sticks will happen. What's much more difficult is ocean-going shipping, uh, intercontinental uh, long-haul uh, uh, aviation, uh, what's much more difficult is, you know, are we really good enough to recycle the amounts of steel that we need to? How do we capture uh, carbon around cement, um, chemicals, refining, etc.? So these are the th places where we need to put our attention. Policy matters. If government doesn't set the table right, we cannot expect business to do the job of government. There is very strong evidence that when long-term policy is set and when it is understood, understood to be non-partisan, private R&D spending shifts in the right direction and, of course, public R&D spending should go too. This is a 2050 long-term target. Working back from 2050, government needs to work out what its benchmarks are for every five years. I'm British... The smartest thing, we don't do many smart things at the moment, but the smartest thing we did was enshrine in law the Climate Change Act because it gives you a domestic ratchet mechanism and it, it allows uh, people to keep their eye on the prize no matter what else is going on. <coughs> Having every country be able to do that, I think, will become essential. So if policy matters then I think the financial sector has to be brought in to harness rather than to deviate from where we want to go. And I think we're beginning to see this now, but there's much more room for financial regulation for the financial sector 
to start to do much more if we want. We talk about the green infrastructure spend that we need for, for the people who don't have energy today and for the people who need better energy for today. We talk about $94 trillion over the next 15 years of infrastructure that's needed. We haven't been investing in infrastructure, brown, green, purple or pink, for the last 20 years. We missed the opportunity of low interest rate environment after the last financial crisis. We didn't build back green after the last financial crisis. Now, maybe we've got another financial crisis coming, I don't know. But we're going to have to uh, find ways to use the financial sector to invest in the things that we need. So I am very optimistic that if I went back to this village in Niger in, Latin, in, in another 10 years, if we did our best and we were focused and disciplined, we could actually have helped transform that uh, village. I'm very optimistic that if I went back to London in 10 years' time, uh, the acrid smell of diesel on the streets would have gone. It would be safe to walk your kid to school and we would be doing better as a result. I believe that this is within our capacity. It's not a story of privation and sacrifice. It is a story of great opportunity, good quality jobs, and skills in a digital AI-influenced world, but one where the energy systems are local as well as global, where the energy systems are clean, where they're efficient. We have the technology, we have the finance, the actual money, it's in the system, it's just not directed to who needs it and the way that they need it when they need it. So I've tried to give you a very, very sort of 64,000 foot tour of some of the challenges, but I believe strongly that it is within our grasp. This is not an extraordinary challenge that we couldn't meet as a society. The question is, are we prepared to elect leaders who are prepared to take the risk? Are we prepared to return them into office? so that uh, they can have a chance to succeed, because you can't do any of these things in two to three or four years. Are we prepared to um, stop politicians politicising this? Are we prepared to dig deep into our pockets in order to spend now so that we save later? Are we prepared to do this for our kids, because to do anything else would be the exact opposite of what we all aspire to be as parents? <laughs> And are we prepared to refresh what it means to be in solidarity? Something that Ireland has done successfully for 20 to 30 years through all of its development aid efforts, through the way in which it has been a friend to uh, independence efforts around the world. Climate change is going to take people's independence away. Ireland should be on the front line of making sure they keep it. Thank you very much. <laughs>